Well, thank you very much, Kenny, for the kind introduction. As Kenny has mentioned, I was a seed developer and a seed saver in Western Canada, but primarily a seed developer, my wife and I, in canola, where since 1947 we were developing canola that was resistant to certain diseases that we had on the prairies. I was also a seed saver, like hundreds of thousands of farms around the world saved their seed from year to year and planted it. Besides being a farmer, I was also a member of the provincial legislature. I was mayor of my community for over a quarter of a century. And as a member of the government, I always worked in agricultural issues for the betterment of farmers, rules, laws, regulations, both on the federal level and also on the provincial level. Now, what has, I go into immediately, what has happened to me? 1998, without any prior knowledge, Monsanto laid a lawsuit against me that I had infringed on their patent. They said that I had grown Monsanto's GMO canola without a license and therefore infringed on their patent. It was a real shock to us at that time because I had never had nothing to do with Monsanto, never bought their seed, never went to a Monsanto meeting, never even knew a Monsanto rep. But the real issue that really concerned us at that time was that possibly our pure seed that we had developed after half a century of research and development would now be contaminated or was contaminated. And we stood up to Monsanto and said, if you have any of your GMOs in our pure seed, then you are liable. You are guilty for destroying the property of others. I believe that the whole issue of GMOs can be divided into three categories. The first category where I'm involved with the property rights of people or farmers versus the intellectual property rights, patent laws of multinationals such as Monsanto. The second issue, the health and food issue. The third issue, the environmental issue. Now, in the two years of pretrial, Monsanto withdrew all allegations that I had ever obtained their seed illegally. They even admitted it was a false allegation on their part. But they said that did not matter. They had found some GMO canola plants in the ditch along my field, and they were grown there, and I infringed on their patent. That is basically the basis. It went to the Federal Court of Canada with one judge. Now, what happened? after two and a half weeks of trial, June of the year 2000. And what the judge ruled is what really made my case internationally known because concerns were raised all over the world about farmers' rights and the farmers' rights and ability to use their own seed from year to year. Remember, one judge, Federal Court of Canada. And this is what he ruled. It does not matter how Monsanto's GMOs gets into or onto any farmer's field or into his seed supply. It doesn't matter how it gets there. And he went on to specify how this could happen. Direct seed movement by birds, by bees, and especially by wind, especially on the prairies, floods and so on, and cross-pollination. It doesn't matter how it gets there. And if it gets into an organic farmer's field, into a conventional farmer's field like myself, your seeds, your plants, all becomes Monsanto's ownership. It was a very startling decision. He also ruled, which was really the hardest one of my wife and myself, was the fact he said we were not allowed to use our seeds or plants again, and also that all my seeds and plants, what we had developed over half a century, goes to Monsanto. Now, you can imagine how we felt, losing half a century of work and development, and all, and then he also ruled that all the profit from my 1998 canola crop goes to Monsanto. What we had done is that I had samples taken from every one of my canola fields. They were sent to the University of Manitoba 
where two scientists did checks on the purity of our seed, and they found that from two of our fields there was no contamination. Some fields had 1%, 2%, 8%, and in the ditch along the one field, it was around 60%. But he also ruled, the judge also ruled, that even from the land that had no contamination, it also goes to Monsanto because he said there was a probability that land contained some of Monsanto's GMOs because I was a seed saver using my seed from year to year. We immediately applied to the Federal Court of Appeal. And the Federal Court of Appeal has three judges. Again, no jury. And after a year, what did the Federal Court of Appeal rule? They upheld the first judge's decision, but they went on to say that even though they didn't agree with all of the first judge's decision, they still upheld it. Now, after that ruling against me, we're now into the year 2003. We then appealed it to the Supreme Court of Canada. And it took about a year, and it cost us a lot, a lot of money, because Monsanto did every legal maneuver possible to stop it from being heard by the Supreme Court of Canada. And last May of this year, the Supreme Court ruled in my favor that they would hear the case. The case before the Supreme Court will be heard on January the 20th of 2004. And there will be many issues decided in that, in that case. The whole issue of patenting life-giving forms, as we call it in Canada, the patenting of genes. And I should go back a little bit. What did Monsanto say at my trial? First of all, they said it was a test case to see how far they could exercise patent law, their patent law, over farmers' rights. Other statement they made at my trial, they said by putting a gene into a seed, they invented the seed. When the seed becomes a plant, they invented the plant. Now, if you look at the implications of that, and what it will be before the Supreme Court of Canada is this. If you put one gene in any seed, or any plant, or any life-giving form, whether it be a bird, an animal, or fish, and what about a human being? Does that say they invented you? They have invented me. And that's why it has become such an important issue, not only of the rights of farmers being able to use their seed from year to year, but the whole rights of controlling the whole gene uh, issue and the controlling of human beings, animals, birds, and bees, and so on. So this is what the Supreme Court will be faced with. The Supreme Court has already ruled on one very important issue in Canada, and they ruled that you cannot patent a higher life form in Canada, which includes a seed or a plant. I have before me a contract from Monsanto. To me, it's one of the most repulsive contracts on the face of this earth, because basically it takes all farmers' rights away. And I'll just give you a few clauses, or read to you a few clauses. Number one, you cannot use your own seed. Number two, you must always buy your seed each year. Number three, you can only use Monsanto's chemicals. Another clause, if you commit some violation of this contract, you must sign a non-disclosure statement that you cannot talk to the, to the press, to your neighbor, what Monsanto has done to you. So it takes a farmer's freedom of speech and expression away. There's another clause. You must permit Monsanto's police force to come onto your land for three years after you sign this contract, even though you may only grow it one year, they can go into your granaries or your silos, onto your land to inspect and see what you're growing or what you have in storage. They can ask for your, your farming records, your income tax records, anything. They, and you must permit them to do that. Now, another clause that has been added to the 2003 contract is that you can no longer sue 
Monsanto for whatever reason. So that is why I think it's so important for you to know the other side of the story with the introduction of GMOs and how rights of people are being taken away by a multinational. Another very important issue, and it's very dear to me and my family, is the issue of how Monsanto advertises in their brochures and states that if you think your neighbor is growing Monsanto's GMO canola or soybeans without a license, you should inform on your neighbor. If you inform on your neighbor, if you happen to do this, you get a free leather jacket from Monsanto. I'm dead serious about this. Now, what happens when Monsanto gets this tip or rumor? They'll immediately send two of their police. And in Canada, they're ex-Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the United States to hire Pinkerton Investigation Services. They'll send two of these people out to a farmer's home. And believe me, what happens isn't nice. I've had many farm wives phone me, crying on the phone and say, what do we do? We've had Monsanto's police here. And they'll say to a farmer, we have this tipper rumor, you're growing GMO canola or soybeans without a license. And a farmer will say, no, I never bought your seed. I've never had nothing to do with you. And they'll say, you're lying. We're going to get you. If you don't confess, we'll drag you through the court systems and you won't have a farm left. Now, what do you think happens when these police, we call them gene police in Canada, uh, happens? And what does a farmer think or a farmer's wife think? Was it this farmer or this neighbor? Was it this neighbor over here or this neighbor over here that has caused me this trouble? So all of a sudden now you have the breakdown of farmers not trusting one another, farmers not talking to one another because of Monsanto's contract. And believe me, it's the whole breakdown of our world's social fabric. Monsanto doesn't stop there. They are as ruthless as you can get anybody to be or any corporation to be. Here's a letter. We don't know how many thousands of these letters have been sent to farmers by Monsanto. And it states, we have reason to believe that you might be growing Monsanto's GMOs without a license. We estimate you have 500 acres, 100 acres, 200 acres. Send us $100,000, $50,000. I got one in front of me, $171,000. And we may or may not take you to court. And furthermore, you're not allowed to show this letter to anyone. You can imagine, just think of the fear in a farm family when you get a letter from a multi-billion dollar corporation send, telling you or asking you, send us this amount of money, 100000 or whatever, by a certain date. The fear it puts in a farmer. Farmers that have spoken against Monsanto or said something negative about Monsanto will also get letters. The best way, and Monsanto knows that, that you can control people is by the culture of fear and they, they divide and rule conquer attitude. So those are some of the things that you never ever hear about, how our rights and the suppression of our freedom of speech has been taken and is being taken away with the introduction of GMOs, and it's in both our countries. Now, two important points. Number one, there is no such thing as containment. Believe me, as a farmer for half a century, or over half a century, you cannot contain a life-giving form once you put it into the environment. A life form like a seed or a plant. You cannot contain it. The wind, cross-pollination, and so on. And I don't care what the level of contamination, if it is zero, half of one percent, or zero point three, it eventually, it will contaminate and will move. There is no such thing as containment. The number two, there is no such thing as coexistence. You introduce a life-giving form, a gene, into the environment. It is the dominant gene, and it will take over an organic farmer or a conventional farmer in a matter of just a few years. In Canada, after the introduction of GMOs in 1996 and right across the border to us, in North Dakota and Montana, GMO soybeans. Within two years, canola in Canada had become a superweed. Now, what is a superweed? 
Our super weed is a mutant canola, regular canola conventional plant. And within two years, it had taken the genes of two other companies that were selling GMOs, along with Monsanto, was now all in one plant and became a new super weed. And that super weed is all over the western prairies. It's in wheat fields, in barley fields, in oats fields, which now takes a new, more powerful, highly toxic chemical, or three chemicals, to kill it. So that is what has happened with the introduction of GMOs. There is no such thing as coexistence. Organic farmers in Canada no longer can grow two crops, soybeans and canola especially. All our seed is now contaminated. We can no longer sell one bushel of canola to the European Union. We have lost our markets all over the world. And I won't go into the issue of economics and how that has affected the farmer's income and increased costs of production. Now, you may ask, why did farmers ever grow GMOs? 1996, when regulatory approval was given to Monsanto in both our countries. And what were farmers told? They were told it was more nutritious, a bigger yielder, and less chemicals. And I think the, the less chemical issue is what really caught the farmer's ear. Because we knew after half a century of chemical use that we were contaminating our water, our soil, our air, and the health of our people. And farmers, when they heard that, they thought, well, maybe this is a new way we can cut down on chemical uses if you were a conventional farmer. What happened? Two years, three years, and four years later, we found out it was not a bigger yielder. And even the United States Department of Agriculture not long ago, also admitted and stated that in the yield of soybeans, it's about 15% less with GMO soybeans. Canola is down about 6.4%. But now we have the increased use of chemicals because of the new superweeds that have been created. What about the nutritional value? Something, again, you never hear about. The quality of GMO foods from plants are about half the quality of conventional seeds and plants. So now we got more chemical use, a poor quality food, and also less yields. Now Monsanto said other things in 1996. They said, now we'll always have sustainable agriculture. Now we'll be able to food, feed a hungry world. Believe me, with the introduction of GMOs, we will lead to more starvation and more hunger in the world with the introduction of GMOs. I would like to also mention that a short time ago, I spent time in Japan. And I met with many Japanese scientists, and they did extensive studies on Monsanto's uh, reports that they supplied to both the Canadian and the American governments on what they call the substantially equivalency of GMO foods. When food or when a plant is introduced into the environment, especially the Canadian government, is, if it's deemed substantially equivalent, the government doesn't do any testing. They only use the data supplied to them by the corporation, and in this case, Monsanto. And what it does the Japanese scientists who have just released their scientific studies of the whole information that was supplied to our governments, it says a fraudulent conclusion. I also have information from, from uh, Switzerland, from the Netherlands, that the food that we're eating is not substantially equivalent and is dangerous in many cases to human health. And I think the greatest curse is still coming. And that's coming in the line of prescription drug plants or pharma plants. There are six major drugs that are now being produced by plants. You hear very, very little but about it. And there's many, many test plots already in both our countries. And it's in the environment, not enclosed. I'll mention some of that. It's vaccines produced by plants already, industrial enzymes, blood thinners, blood clothing proteins, growth hormones, and contraceptives. 
Now, I'll list some of the dangers that can arise from this, and I'll use two examples. What if somebody's had a major surgery, and they then eat a food that is contaminated with a blood thinner? Or what about a pregnant woman who eats a food that contains a contraceptive? What are the results? This is what's coming, and this is the reasons we should be so concerned. In closing, I look at it this way. My wife and I look at it this way. What kind of a legacy do we want to leave to our children and our grandchildren? We have five children, and as Kenny has said, 14 grandchildren, but there's one on the way, so there'll be 15 grandchildren. What kind of a legacy do we want to leave to them? And we as elderly people, what kind of a legacy do we want to leave to our children? A legacy of land, food, and water, an air full of poisons? No, we want to leave a legacy of land, food, air, and water without poisons. This is why one of the reasons I'm here today to bring that message, especially to the younger generation, how your rights and how your freedoms can be lost overnight, your choice taken away, farmers' rights being taken away. My wife is 72 and I'm 73. And we don't know how many good years we got left. But the good years we got left, we're gonna go down fighting for the rights of farmers. <laughs>